Thank you. Dobro dan svima. Ako vam ne smeta, ja ću dali na engleskom. Kako znate, hrvatski je svetski jezik kojim govore samo najpametni ljudi na svijetu. Nisam toliko pametni, ali trudim se. Ali lakše na engleskom, ako to je ok. Um, so my name's Paul Bradbury. I'm a, a British guy from Manchester, fat Brit, who was uh, born in the rain in Manchester, the rainiest uh, city in England. And I moved to the sunniest island in Croatia, the island of Khwar, in 2003 via Somaliland in East Africa, where I was working as an aid worker. Um, <clears throat> I saw an advert on, T on CNN, um, Croatia, the Mediterranean, as it once was and I looked, it was absolutely beautiful, and I looked around Somalia, which wasn't quite so beautiful. And so that's how I ended up coming to Croatia uh, just over 20 years ago. And um, at the time, I was going to be an aid worker forever, um, and I was going to have just Croatia as my base. Um, but uh, then I met a girl, and um, I ended up staying for, uh, for 20, 20 odd years now. Um, and it's the best decision of my life. And I've been now living here for 20 years. And I genuinely, honestly believe that Croatia is the best place to live in Europe, which a lot of people here in Croatia think this is a little bit crazy because everybody's complaining and everybody's emigrating. Uh, in 2016, uh, there were 650,000 migrants walking through Croatia on their way to Germany, to Sweden, and to places like that. And um, I was a Brit who could have, before Brexit, could have moved anywhere. And I decided to come to Croatia when everybody else was passing through. And all I've heard since I've moved to Croatia is the big E word of emigration, 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 as the population has gone down um, further and further and further. And um, after 20 years of living here, I have a very different perspective of how life is in Croatia compared to perhaps how local people see things. Um, it took me um, 15 years to really understand how Croatia worked. Because when I first came here, I thought it was just this beautiful place. I lived on Hvar, I had a house in Yelsa. And to me, it was just this tourist bubble. Everything was perfect. The bureaucracy was a bit slow, but I thought that was because the sun was shining and people were just a bit relaxed about life. And um, then after about 15 years, uh, after I started my news portal, Total Croatian News, uh, which is the first English language news portal for Croatia, I came across the U word. Not Ustasha, but Uhlebistan. And um, I suddenly became aware of the real reason that, in my opinion, people are emigrating. And um, it, of course, it's because of low salaries and opportunity, but it's because of the corruption and the nepotism and the lack of hope, um, I think, is, is a, lot more, a lot more of it. And the more I sort of looked into it, I started writing about it in English for the first time. And then people started connecting to me, saying, wow, here is a foreigner who's actually interested to know how Croatia works. Um, and so that led me down to a journey where I really managed to go a lot, a lot deeper into Croatia than maybe many foreigners who live here. I've traveled all over Croatia. I know Slavonia very well, for example. And um, I've made a few observations about, uh, about, about Croatia. But before I do, just hands in the air. You guys will be graduating quite soon. How many of you, put your hands in the air, are thinking of emigrating? Okay, and how many of you are thinking of st definitely staying in Croatia? Okay, and so most of you still haven't decided, okay. Um, okay, so my personal experience um, uh, of Croatia, and people laugh at me for this, is I think it's one of the most positive countries in the world. And um, every time I say that, people go, you're crazy, you don't understand what's going on here. And I think it's really, really true. One of the truest things to say about Croats themselves is a Croat can forgive you anything but success. If you're successful here in Croatia, Croats will find a way just to put you down, to knock you down and everything else. And so I think probably the, the, the best comment I ever saw on, um, on, a, on, a, on a portal in Croatia, because as you know, you see the Naslov and you see the commentary and nobody actually reads the articles these days. They just go into the arguments underneath. And it was an article about Mati Rimac about four years ago. And somebody in the commentary said, um, you know, yeah, but where did Rimac get his money from? How did he get started? And um, 
you know, the comment underneath that was, imagine if everybody in Croatia who had some money from the war, or, or from their parents who were from the war, had done for Croatia what Remats has done for Croatia, what a country would, we would have, you know? And so this is a country where, you know, if you're successful and smart, you keep that success to yourself and to your inner circle. Because for you to go up and say, hey, I'm the best, don't worry, within 27 seconds, you'll be mown down by everybody else. And so from, from my perspective, there are two Croatias. There's the Croatia in the public, and this is the Croatia where you guys sit in cafes, you are world champions at complaining. Um, you'll sit in a cafe, you'll complain for two hours over an espresso, and then you'll go home, and that was a great social event for you because you've been able to spend two hours complaining. Nothing will ever change. Um, when was the last time, you know, you guys were on the streets protesting if it wasn't football? You know, you'll celebrate, you celebrate football, you celebrate the, the death of Oliver Drogo, Drogojevic, for example, but when it comes to protesting about change, you're much happier going into the cafes and sitting there and complaining. And so, in my opinion, after 20 years here, I think that um, there is this culture of just complaining and being negative, and then there is also this uh, culture of uh, keeping success under the radar and really just having this, what I call a default negative mindset. And so around here, you know, people seem to love hearing the bad news and hearing people failing and so on. And so um, I started writing a few critical pieces on my, on my news portal, Telecreation News. I started writing a few positive pieces. And then I thought, you know, I wonder if we can find success stories of everyday people who are really trying in Croatia and are doing their own businesses and so on. And I put this out uh, on Facebook and I asked people, would you like to, um, would anybody like to do an interview with me about a business they've started and, and so on like that. And this one guy from uh, Koprivnitz, a guy from Ivan Mlinar, he was 20 years old. He was uh, a bladesmith, so he made knives professionally. He was the only person in Croatia who was the, um, in the American Bladesmith Association. And he had no real money to start off with, but he had a passion. And so one of my interns did a story with him. And it was a really good story. We got some good coverage. And then I said, send this to the tourist board of Koprivnica. Send it to the mayor of Koprivnica. It got into the um, regional media. And by Saturday night, KRT uh, was down with the television cameras doing a feature story on him and everything else. He was on the nas national news. And people were going, this is um, a fan... Ah, uh -huh. this, this is a really, really good positive story. Um, but, you know, how many more of these stories are there? And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these stories in Croatia um, that um, I'm coming across. And but a lot of them don't want to be out there in the in the uh, in the, um, in the in the mainstream media. But what I'm finding underneath in Croatia is there is this culture um, of trying to live in Croatia and trying to avoid interacting with Croatia. And so um, I, I did an article a few a few uh, a few months ago called uh, "The Three Stages of Learning in Croatia for Foreigners: Love." hate and nirvana and like 95 percent of foreigners who come to croatia totally love croatia because it is beautiful it's two-week holiday the girls are amazing the guys are amazing the seat in the sun the sea everything and they go back and go what an amazing country i can't understand why people would even consider leaving here and, um, and then you have about four percent of foreigners who are so in love with croatia that they move to croatia and they start businesses in Croatia. And it doesn't take them very long until they realize that um, the reason a lot of people are emigrating is because of the corruption, nepotism, and everything else. And they find the bureaucracy really, really infuriating. And they end up hating Croatia. And then you have this other 1%, even less than 1%. And it took me 15 years to get to this point. And those are the foreigners that reach nirvana. And those are the foreigners who are like the prayer. They say, accept the things you cannot change 
have the courage to change the things that you can and have the wisdom to know the difference. Okay, so to translate that into the Croatian thing, um, it meant for me, rather than getting angry about the bureaucracy and, art and the high taxation and everything else, in my mind, if I could just accept, I live in a beautiful country with a great lifestyle and um, the price I pay for that is higher taxation and bureaucracy and so on. And if I accept that, and if I can package that into my head as what I call an uchleb tax, and I pay my uchleb tax every year or every month or every day or whatever, but once that's paid mentally, I'm totally free. And now I'm not fighting with the system anymore. I'm not engaging in those negative arguments on index commentary and that stuff. I'm actually just getting on with my life. And um, I equate the uchleb tax a little bit like with being an alcoholic in Norway. Okay, so a lot of people like living in Norway because it has a great, it's a very different lifestyle, but has a great lifestyle. And if you're an alcoholic in Norway, a beer will cost you 10 euros. Okay, and a beer in Croatia is two or three euros. So if you're an alcoholic wanting value for money, you would come to Croatia. But if you're an alcoholic who really enjoys the, um, the way of life in Norway, you're happy to pay your alcohol tax and then you get on with your lifestyle. And I find it's the same way here in Croatia, that if you pay your uchleb tax and then you, and then you move on. Um, and, so, and since I've done that, um, I've met so many positive people in this country, uh, mostly Croats, who are all existing in their own little bubbles. They've all figured out a way to pay their, mentally pay their uchleb tax and to engage with the rest of the country, with the nature, with the lifestyle, with the safety, with the authentic experiences, with, with the amazing food, all these different things. And they found a way to separate that from that. And um, to me, it was revolutionary because I was getting more and more frustrated with Croatia. I was thinking maybe I should leave too because I just can't cope with all this bureaucracy and all this pressure and all this, this. And if you can just separate the two, it made, it made a huge difference. Um, I'm quite a positive person about Croatia, as you've probably, probably noticed already. And um, I wrote an article uh, recently called um, uh, Eight Reasons Why Croatia is the Best Place to Live in Europe. And a lot of people uh, were laughing at me for it. Um, it got a lot of media attention. Uh, got a lot of, I think we had about 300,000 hits on, on YouTube and, and, and stuff like that. And then I also wrote an, uh, did a video called uh, 10 Things Croatia Does Better Than Any Other Country, which again, people were like, what the hell is this about? Um, but then when people watched the video and they looked at those 10 things and they were like, huh, actually, yeah, maybe, huh. Yeah, and so we had this whole, um, I, I have a YouTube channel now called Paul Bradbury Croatia Expert, and we're focusing on the positive things in Croatia. And um, we had um, a lot of diaspora who have this love of Croatia, but they have this um, fear of coming back to Croatia because it's corrupt, it's communist, it's all, you know, and there's no, there's no jobs and everything else. And they're watching these videos and I see them on LinkedIn, they're sharing them and they're, they're, they're sharing them to their network and they're saying, um, I'm part Croatian and I don't really talk about being Croatian that much, but I have to share this video because I feel so proud about my country and, it's, uh, it's, and, and I've forgotten just how beautiful it is and so on. And the number of people who've contacted me because of these two videos um, are, you know, it's, it's been phenomenal. And a lot of people have come back to Croatia, uh, having read a lot of my articles over the last, uh, last 10 years or so. Um, indeed, recently, um, I, I, have a, I have a relationship with the diaspora, uh, which is very bipolar. Um, when, when I started Total Croatian News in 2015, I didn't really understand um, Croatian politics at all. I didn't really know what Hadeze was or SDP was, and I've been living in the country for 12 years, so that shows what my, my bubble was like um, you know, for so long. And, um, and when I started uh, Total Croatian News, I wanted to have one really amazing interview on the first day that would really impress the diaspora in Australia and Canada, places like that because my target market was to find uh, Croatian-loving, non-Croatian-speaking people, and we would be a bridge with our English language news portal. 
And so I managed to get an interview with the foreign minister of Croatia, which I thought was pretty good uh, for, for a new portal. I went, I went to, see, to the minister's office. And when I published this interview of Vesna Pusic, um, all the right-wing diaspora in Australia completely um, started attacking me for being a Tito-loving this, this, this. And then this is when I first started to learn about Ustasha Partizani, um, kind of like that. Um, and so always from that side of the diaspora, I've been, um, a lot of people attack me. But from the other side of the diaspora, the second generation and the third generation uh, who read the portal because it's, it's something that actually connects Croatia to them. And what they're reading is a very different portrayal of Croatia than they're learning in their communities back in Sydney and in Toronto and places like that. And a lot of these people started connect, contacting me saying, you know, you're, you're not even Croatian, but the way you describe Croatia is very authentic and it's very, very different to what we're learning for. And now we're curious to come and visit. Yeah? And in the last six months, I've had uh, a few death threats, a few lots of abuse from the idiots in Sydney. Uh, and I've had more and more and more and more and more emails from the second generation, the third generation, from inside Croatia. And they said, uh, we've come back. We just want to say thank you for all your help, all the articles. We've come back and we love it. We weren't very sure, but then there were all these other interviews you did and so on like that. And so six months ago, I uh, put on Facebook and LinkedIn, I said, a lot more returnees are now contacting me saying um, that they're back and they're loving it. And I, so does anybody want to do an interview on Total Creation News? I'll give a link to your website. We have some standard questions. How did you feel before? Why did you make the move? What were you worried about? What was the biggest surprise? What was the biggest disappointment? What um, advice do you have for other people thinking of making the return? That kind of stuff. And um, I got 63 emails from people who had returned, who were reading our portal, and that wanted to contribute their stories so that other people could get more information about the realities of what it's like to come and return to Croatia. And so um, we then started doing these interviews and every day, and it was somebody from Sydney who moved to scene, I mean, and, but with five children and was having an, an incredible time. Somebody else was in Osijek, somebody else went to Hua, somebody else was in Chakovitz. So it wasn't just you know, coming to the coast and coming to, and coming to Zagreb. It was people relocating all over the country and the experiences there were very positive. And a lot of the reasons that they mentioned for coming back to Croatia are were in those two videos I did of the eight reasons uh, Croatia is the best and ten, 10 things Croatia does better. And I think everybody should go abroad. I think everybody should travel. I think everybody should live abroad for some time. And I hope you all do, either with jobs or with travel. Um, but I also think uh, it's important for people to be aware of just what they have here, which they're actually not necessarily aware of. Um, and so when I did these two videos, um, a lot of Croatians were going, wow, yes, you're right. I never thought of that, you know? And a lot of the, the I mean, they're very simple reasons, but a lot of the reasons that, that, uh, that, that Croatia is an amazing place to live, um, we take for granted here because this is what you're brought up with. So for example, the first example, the first thing that Croatia has which is probably the best in Europe, is safety. Now, um, a, few, a, few, um, a few years ago, I got a bit drunk uh, during the day in Zagreb, and um, I had my laptop and some beer in my, in my, uh, in my bag. And uh, I got out of a taxi, and a bottle fell out of my bag and smashed on the streets, and I felt, oh gosh, and I walked away. And um, that night I got home to Valajdin where I was living and uh, I put the rest of the beers in the fridge and I went to bed. And in the morning I woke up um, at six o'clock in the morning, I had a writing deadline. I went to my bag to get my laptop and it wasn't there. And me without my laptop is, you know, that's, it's the end of the world. And I was like, I was trying to think where was I yesterday? Um, and then I thought, my God, did I, was I so drunk that I put the laptop in the fridge? So I opened the fridge to see if my laptop was in the fridge, and it wasn't. And then an hour later, 
I get this message on Messenger from an unknown person saying, did you lose a laptop in Zagreb yesterday? And I thought, here comes the ransom. Somebody's got my laptop. They're going to charge me you know, for all my dirty secrets I don't have. Um, and I was like, yes. And they said, oh, we, we found it in the middle of the street in Gundelichova. Uh, we were going to a cafe. Uh, we picked it up. It was a bit broken, so we fixed it. Uh, we opened it, and the first name, it, like the, the, the login was Paul Bradbury. And um, we, uh, so we Googled you, and you were the only Paul Bradbury in Croatia, so we thought maybe it was you. And I was like, yes, thank you. And then I was like, still waiting for the ransom, you know? And, uh, and they said, well, if you want to collect it, uh, I'm working in the shop until six o'clock. So I put all the beers back in the bag, and I drove to, drove to Zagreb, went to the shop, gave him the beers, he gave me the thing back. And that, to me, is just one story, but there are so many stories like that I've heard over the years of, of tourists leaving like a thousand euros by accident, their the, the wallet on the, on the table, and, and they come back an hour later, it's still there, that kind of thing. Contrast that with a woman in South Africa who was in Zagreb, lives in Zagreb, and she said she was living in Croatia for 12 months, knowing it was safe, but it took her 12 months until she felt comfortable enough to leave her mobile phone on the passenger seat of the car with the door locked and with the window closed. Because in South Africa, if you did that at the traffic lights, somebody would smash the thing and take it away. Yeah? Um, and Zagreb, Croatia particularly, and Zagreb, um, has been uh, recognized by the remote work community as being a very, very safe for, place for single females. Uh, and so uh, female travelers, uh, I think it's a, there's a 20% discrepancy between uh, female nomads coming to, 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 to Croatia rather than males because of the safety. And so contrast that when I was a student at the age of 19 in Manchester, uh, and this was 35 years ago, so it's a lot worse now, I would go to my ATM to get some cash and I would feel a knife in my back saying 200 pounds please. And I would say, sure. You know? So this thing about safety is one of the amazing things that Croatia has that doesn't mark it, but it's something that a lot of the diaspora who are coming back from Australia, places like that, they're raising their families in Croatia because it's safer for families. Yeah, so it's, something, it's just something you should, you, you should I think, be aware of. Uh, the, the other thing, number two, was lifestyle. Like, um, I mean, especially down in Dalmatia where, you know, we have Fiaco and everything, but um, the number of times I've just been in a cafe, sat there for two, three hours here, had a really good conversation, but also got business done. You know, I think 56% of all business gets done in cafes in, in Croatia, you know? And so, and what I, what I really, really love about, um, about life in Croatia compared to life in the UK is the informality of it and the spontaneity of it. So you can see somebody going down the street and you can somehow find time for a coffee. Whereas in the UK, it's like, let's get our diaries out and let's see maybe in two weeks, this, this, this. And everybody's working so hard trying to make everything happen that uh, that sense of lifestyle is something that is, uh, that is really, really uh, a huge, huge benefit here for, for Croatia that people here take for granted because this is all that you're used to unless you've traveled. Um, one thing also that is a huge thing here which we've lost in the West is community. Uh, the Croats, especially in times of adversity, um, are an extremely close nation and they have very, very close family ties. Living on, living on an island, um, I just knew that, you know, I'd go down to the cafe with my, with my kids and I could let them run around and not even have to worry about looking after them because I knew within the wider community somebody would know if they go past there, they're going to have a look, they're going to look after and so on like that. Things like the olive harvest, um, where you get four or five generations of the same family all coming together to do these traditional things. These are things that uh, we just don't have um, in, in the West at all, really. And these are things that I think as you, as people who emigrate, they, they, they see there's definitely different opportunities and stuff, but that kind of thing is something that really Croatia has, and it's a very, very strong thing. I think it's, I think it's magnificent. Um, I think also um, your, um, one of the big things is food. Again, um, you, I mean, people say Croatia is the best food in the world, blah, blah, blah. But I tell you what, um, when, I first came, when I first came to Croatia, uh, to Hoa, 
uh, I, was in a, I was in a small grocery store in, uh, in Yelsa, and there was this uh, English woman in front of me in November. This is in 2003. And she said, I want some tomatoes. And uh, the guy said, sorry, it's not the season for tomatoes. And she was like, what do you mean? Because in England, we have tomatoes which grow in supermarkets 24, 7, 12 months a year. They're very orange, they're very watery, they're very, very tasteless. And what I learned very quickly about Croatia and Croatian food, and you can ask, you can ask anybody who's been abroad, uh, who lives abroad, about how they feel about Croatian food, uh, about the freshness of it. Um, uh, and, and it's like, you know that you can only get asparagus in March, but that asparagus is going to be phenomenal. And you find yourself looking forward, yearning for that particular thing. Uh, you know that you know, the, the mandarin season is in November. You know that the tomatoes are coming here, this, this, this. And so what Croatia does is it has extremely fresh and extremely tasty food, only available at certain parts of the year. And they adapt their different diets to it. Um, to, to give you an example of how you guys perhaps take things for granted where we for foreigners think this is amazing. I think the best example I can give you is a friend of mine who was, uh, runs a tour group, uh, a, a tour agency on Hua, and he had a bunch of rich New York Jews coming to, uh, to uh, an olive grove. And they were having uh, a pecker and they were doing olive oil tasting and it was a beautiful day, fantastic event, everyone was very happy. And then this one Jewish guy said, excuse me, is, is that a lemon tree over there? And, uh, and he says, yes. Would it be okay if I went and picked a lemon? And Ante said, go and pick six if you like. He says, really? He said, yeah. So he went and picked six lemons. And um, at the end of the week, he had this incredible trip. And he said, this was one of the best trips of my life. But I want to tell you what was the most amazing part of this, um, of this trip. It was picking that lemon. Because I'm a successful businessman in New York. And the only lemons I've ever seen have been in supermarkets and cocktail bars. And just to make that connection with nature uh, was just a phenomenal thing. And at this point, my friend realized that this is the secret of successful tourism. And what we do is we just, uh, we take what we have for granted that's free and we sell it for a very high price. And these kind of tours now are huge. People are really, really, really um, interested in this kind of tourism because it's unique and it's authentic. And this is one of the things that Croatia has that is better than anywhere else in the world, I think, which is authentic experiences. Everybody now is looking for something different. And if you come to Croatia, you can find in every village they have their own uh, feast days, they have all these different things going on, 12 months a year all over the country. And Cro uh, foreigners are just finding this incredibly, incredibly attractive. Um, one of my best friends here is an American digital nomad called Steve Sensorensky, and I've taken him all over Croatia. He loves it. And he said to me that the um, best experience he had in his first 12 months in Croatia was not going to Hvala Dubrovnik, all the plit bits up. It was he, he was invited into a high school to come and talk about why an American is moving to Croatia. Okay, and um, he said he went in there and he was just amazed because everybody was like, how do I get to America, this, 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 and all they wanted to do was get to America. And he said, hang on a minute, can I tell you why I think America sucks and why I'm in Croatia? And um, so for the next hour, he had this question and answer session with the kids. And he could see for the first time the kids were going, wow, here's an American who's very, very passionate about Croatia, and maybe Croatia's not that bad. And maybe, maybe Croatia does have some positive points. And this, to me, is the biggest battleground for Croatia today, apart from the nepotism and the, and the corruption. And it's the mindset. Because I said before, I think you guys have got this default negative mindset. And if you can surround yourself with those pos positive bubbles, if you can surround yourself, pay your Uchlib tax and then look at the rest of it, if you can see the opportunities and connect with other like-minded people, 
there is an incredible bubble of energy in this country. And I think one of the biggest opportunities for Croatia um, is the remote work revolution. And um, I mean, I guess you guys, IT and stuff, uh, engineering, uh, for, for you guys too. Um, remote workers are starting to really discover Croatia in a big way because they can work anywhere as long as they have the internet connection and they can fix their time zones uh, with their offices and they can work literally anywhere. And the things that they are looking for are <coughs> safety, lifestyle, authentic experiences, nature, great food, great wine, um, things to do, hiking, swimming, the sea, uh, every single thing that Croatia has here. And more and more of these remote workers are coming and they're also bringing with them something which is even more important for Croatia, in my opinion, and that is mindset. So you're getting these successful um, entrepreneurs, remote workers who are coming to Croatia and they're going into communities and they're getting involved in those communities and they're sharing their experiences. And local people are thinking, wow, here is an opportunity. These guys think this, the OSIEC is fantastic. Why am I thinking it's so negative? And if you can start drip feeding that mindset into, um, into uh, in, into things here, I, I think it will have a, an effect on, uh, on, on, the, on the younger generation. Um, and I mean, how, how do you feel about the remote work revolution? Are you, are you looking to be a remote workers, anyone? Yeah? Where, whereabouts are you thinking of going? Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but but I I really think I mean and it's you know now there's like there's a cryptocurrency festival in Baranja, for example, and so some Germans have bought a piece of land in Karanac, and now they're they're starting communities there, and you're finding a lot more of these things that are happening, and, and people are now uh, seeing that Croatia's it's a bit more affordable, even though people here don't think it is. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's got that, that safety, that nature, that lifestyle, and so on like that. Um, so I've got a bit more safe. Anyone, anyone got any questions so far? Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, you moved from Yeltsin to Yeah. Why is that so? Uh, so I moved, uh, so I, I, I bought my house in Yeltsin in 2002, and I lived there for, uh, until 2016. And I had, uh, we had two, two kids, two, uh, and when they were eight and ten, it seemed to me a good time to move because I think living on a Dalmatian island is an incredible experience. And if you ever get the chance to do it for a year, I would absolutely um, recommend it for a year. And, um, but then after that, when the kids get to about ten years old, there's not so much to do. And I also didn't want them to do just be island children. Um, and so we were looking for a place. Zagreb seemed a little bit too big, and so in the end we decided to go to Valjdin. And we lived there for five years, and then high school, so we came to Zagreb. And um, so you're in Zagreb now? yeah, I'm in Zagreb now. I have two years now. Yeah, and uh, I think I think Zagreb's amazing, honestly. Um, uh, Zagreb ten years ago I thought was the most boring city in the world, um, and now uh, I, I mean, I've 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 lived in ten different countries, and I've I've travelled to ninety six and. Um, I genuinely think that Zagreb's the best place I've ever lived. I think uh, the change in the last three or four years has been phenomenal. Um, a lot of it has been this remote work revolution. So there's been a slowly, um, slow interna internationalization of certain aspects of, of Zagreb, which was missing, I think. I think the, 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 the gourmet scene has in improved immensely. There's a lot more choice now. Um, I think the bar scene has, in has, has improved a lot. I think the cultural scene has been amazing. And now, I mean, for example, I took my daughter to an Egyptian night the other, uh, and then two weeks ago, there was this amazing concert from the embassy of Kazakhstan. And so all these different things now happening that perhaps weren't there before. And still you have that safety. And I think Zagreb is the most walkable city I've ever lived in. I, I don't use the tram, I walk everywhere. 
I live in Shalata, I've walked here today, and, I, I, and I'll, I'll walk back again afterwards because uh, it's just, a, even in the rain, um, it's just, a, it's, oh, maybe I'm strange, um, but it's just, it's just a, I think it's, it's a very, very uh, walkable city. I think the, um, you know, the lifestyle is, is great here, and now you have Ryanair, and so uh, you have the chance to, either, to get away or and so on, and two hours you're in Kirk on the beach, and you know, two and a half hours you're in Budapest, you've got the mountains, you've got uh, Zagreb County, um, the crime's very low here, um, and honestly, I don't, I don't see what the negatives are about Zagreb these days. I don't know how you feel as young people. Is it, is it not lively enough? Is it okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a question regarding what we talked earlier about distancing yourself from the negative mindset. Yeah. Yeah. However, uh, I, I do agree with you when it comes to uh, we take very little time appreciating what, what we have in Croatia and seeing the positive in it. But how do you balance uh, or rather engage in those two mindsets? Because we do still have a responsibility to address the issues that are going on in our country. How do you engage without getting sucked into the... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with that. You do have a responsibility. And, and I think... Um, um, I'll, I'll talk about the death of hope in a sec. But yeah, um, so... Like, detaching from the, from the negativity uh, is... A friend of mine said something very, very true. She's one of the people that lives in these bubbles. She's, uh, she's in adventure tourism. She pays at Uclip tax. She goes hiking at the weekends. She has minimum sort of thing. And she said to me, you know what? Um, every six months, I check in to see what the political situation is in Croatia. And I don't follow it for the six months beforehand at all. I've got, I've got no idea what's going on. And after six months, I check how it was, and nothing's changed. And then you have the other friend who is up in the morning reading everything that Milanovic says, and Plenkovic says this, and then, you know, the, and then the elections are coming, and this, and this, and this. And you lose, you lose years of your life um, following this, you know, stressing about it, is this person going to resign, is this corruption, is this not? And this person has said, okay, I live in this country, it has its faults. And one of the faults it's got is this negative sort of thing. And so I choose not to engage in that. Um, and I think at the, uh, but, but you, you do have a civic responsibility, and I think you do that through local groups. You, you find like-minded people who want to, to make a change. So if, for example, if you look at the mayor of Split, Ibit Zapuljak, and his wife Mariana, who I, I know quite well, they got into politics. Uh, they didn't want to get into politics. Yeah, they were physicists. That, yeah, she, he's, a, he's a famous physicist, and she's, you know, um, I'm not sure what she's done before. They wanted to campaign to get a new kindergarten for their local community. That's how they started. And they got that, and then somebody said, well, why don't you form a party to try and get some influence in, in, in the council and split? And then you know, they, they ran on this agenda of this, 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 and then they got that, and then suddenly there was an opportunity to stand for the mayor, and, you know, now, he's, and now he is where he is and stuff. So, um, and you know, I, I, I don't really, I, I've got two or three Croatian politicians that I respect, and he's one of them. And when you hear him speak, it's very, very, it's very, very simple. He doesn't want any of this crap. It's like, you know, Ili, Ili, Horvatsko, Ili, Hadeze, you know, that kind of stuff. And he's, he's very, very um, fo focused. Yeah, but, it, but, you know, and that kind of stuff. And I, I appreciate that kind of approach, whereas all the stuff playing back and forth, back and forth, it's just, it just takes everybody's, um, everybody's uh, energy. And it just contributes to that, gosh, I'm in this cycle of negativity. And if I just emigrate, it would be. Um, but on, on immigration, um, I also think it's, uh, it's very, well, I did a second series on, on Total Creation News. I said, OK, because uh, everybody says, it's OK for you. You're a millionaire because you're foreign. You must be getting loads and loads of money. Yeah, um, which I wish it was true. Um, and uh, well, first of all, I did a video saying, is it really true that every foreigner in Croatia is really rich? And I said, yes, it is true. I know most of my foreign friends in Croatia are working on Croatian salaries, but they're very rich because what they've, what they've come here for is to appreciate the safety, the lifestyle, the authentic experiences. And it's a bit like the, um, 
the fisherman and the and the and the billionaire. You know, the fisherman's there, and the billionaire says, you know, if you work a bit harder, you could you know get another boat, and then you can get another boat, and and then the fisherman says, okay, I've got 60 boats and 30 staff, and now what? He says, then you could retire, and he says, well, that's what I was doing in the first place, you know, kind of stuff. So it's uh, it's about it's about how you see priorities uh, in life, but. One of the things that I think is a really big negative in Croatia, um, and I totally understand it, uh, is something that I call the death of hope. Okay, so um, you had the war, it was terrible, but at least in my opinion, what happened after the war was uh, even worse for Croatia in terms of all the, the theft and, and the things that went on. And for the last 30 years, Croatians have been promised a lot and delivered nothing. So much so that every time somebody has another a great idea, the immediate uh, reaction is because this is Croatia. It wouldn't work in Croatia. Yeah? And so uh, when you talk about demanding change or getting on the streets to go and protest, it's like there's no point because nothing will change. And so you will sit in your cafes and you'll do your complaining, and that's the end of it. And so I think there's a thing called the death of hope in Croatia. And I think there's about maybe a million people that if they were convinced change would come, you could get them on the streets and you could demand that change. But the reason you don't get those million people there is because nobody believes after 30 years of false promises and hope and everything else. And so I, would, so I, I did an article about it, I said like, um, I call it the death of hope, and so if we could get to 100 percent, then uh, we get a million people, and we're maybe at 90 percent. People want it, but they're not going to get over there. And so the only way to get them over there is to raise that 90 to 91 until eventually you get to 100, and then you coordinate something. And so let me give you a very, very simple example, maybe a one percent for this thing, of something that worked incredibly well. And it shows just how Croatia can work when everybody's working together. And that is the digital nomad visa. And if you know how, I don't know how much you know about this, but um, so uh, I was working with a guy called Jan de Jong, who's a Dutch entrepreneur uh, based in Split, very successful businessman. And um, so I, I, I introduced him to the concept of digital nomads. And then he went on and really took this forward. And in uh, July, 2020, during the pandemic, he wrote an open letter to Plenkovic on LinkedIn saying, Dear Prime Minister, I'm a, I'm a Dutch uh, entrepreneur living in Split. Uh, I think there's a huge opportunity for remote work in Croatia. Uh, I think you could be a very forward thinking Prime Minister. And if you play, if we do it all right, uh, you could be the second country in Europe and only the fifth in the world to have a digital nomad visa, which would allow these uh, high earning remote working types from outside the EU to come and bring their spending power into Croatia and also their mindset. So these people work nine to five online in the States and other places, but they have breakfast in, in Croatia, they have lunch in Croatia, they socialize in Croatia, everything's in Croatia. So they're earning internationally and they're spending money here. So it's, it's a great thing. And so from July the 11th, he put this thing out on LinkedIn, and this is the summer holidays in Croatia, remember? August the 25th, six weeks later, uh, Plenkovic tweeted a photograph of him and uh, Jan in Plenkovic's office announcing that we would have a digital nomad visa by the 1st of January 2021. So he was promising this within five months. And you know how slowly legislation goes in Croatia. The next day, they had uh, an amendment to uh, the Aliens Act and they worked with five different ministries, labor, finance, health, uh, tourism, and somebody else. Um, and on the 1st of, 1st of January, 2021, less than six months after he wrote the open letter on LinkedIn, digital nomads were eligible to apply for a visa to come and spend 12 months in Croatia. So this is an example of how Croatia can work. Yeah, if we can get the right, um, if we can get the right things. And I think there are more and more cases of that happening. And of course, Uklebistan is there and um, it's, 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 it's everywhere. But I, I also think that the twin viruses of transparency and technology are slowly uh, chipping away at that. 
And now we have a younger generation with a different mindset. It's not so fixed in the past. Um, I, think, I think probably my favorite moment in the last 10 years in the Balkans, I call this the Balkans, sorry, because um, <clears throat> it is, <laughs> um, uh, was um, I was in Tirana in Albania. And um, I had some business down there. And my former driver, a guy called Jimmy, uh, who's now one of my best friends and a very successful tourism guy. He had a daughter called Ami, and I met Ami f 15 years ago uh, when she was one year old. And she was living in this not very nice part of Tirana. I saw her every year, saw her growing up to be about eight, nine. She didn't speak a word of English. Uh, hey, Paul, that's it. And then I went back last year. She was 16 years old. She was a very proud Albanian. She was totally fluent in English. She didn't have a Balkan gene in her body. And she was about to address the European Youth Parliament on issues about integrating Albania into certain things. And to me, I thought, wow, this is the end of a whole generation of negative mindset of Ustashi Partizani and all that, all that stuff. And now you have this young generation of global citizens who are you know inspired by things on the internet not what they hear at the dinner table from their from their parents trying to indoctrinate them and stuff so um so I, I think it's a really exciting time um and i really think that if you look at the mindset again um so i, I i'm always i was saying i'm always criticized for being a, you're a rich foreigner so i then said on Facebook, I said, do I know any Croatian friends who live in Croatia and earn internationally, earn a good salary internationally, who would give me an interview? And uh, I got 15 interviews, which you can all read on, on, on South Croatian News, and it was staggering. They had just two things in common. All, all 15 had two things in common. They weren't rich people. They weren't people with exceptional skills. The two things they had were mindset and determination. So the first girl was a, uh, a design student from Zagreb University, so she just graduated. Uh, she, she's from Bashka Voda down in Dalmatia. She wanted to stay in Bashka Voda. Um, she was working as a waitress, but she wanted to become a designer and, and, to, and a graphic designer. And she couldn't get any work locally. Uh, and so she started sending out emails she sent out a thousand emails uh, showcasing her work, applying for different jobs, everything else. And finally, after about a thousand emails, she got one small contract from Sweden. And she did an amazing job. And that small contract became a bigger contract and got referrals and everything else. And so now she works 30 hours uh, a week on the beach uh, to get her inspiration. And she's earning very, very good money living down doing that. The, uh, there's another girl who is, uh, lives in Sphere she's Chanhua. She's an Amazon pay-per-click. I mean, not, not a crazy, um, crazy talented kind of, uh, kind of job, but she's managed to make that work and stuff. And all these different people um, are determined to stay in Croatia. And there's a real mindset, again, mindset of, it's, it's OK for you. You're a foreigner. We don't earn very much money. Salaries are terrible. We're just waiting for things to happen to us. Nothing ever happens. And as soon as Croats emigrate, their mindset changes. They start becoming the hardest working people in the world. Yeah? So you know, they'll, they'll sit here and complain about how terrible Croatia is, and then they'll get, get a job cleaning toilets in Ireland, and they'll work their asses off, and they'll, they'll work to do, to do better. And those two things of determination and mindset are they're, they're something that you, everybody can have, and every, if, you, if, you, if you really, really want something. Um, there is this mentality here, everyone's just waiting for something to be, to, to be given. And nobody's giving anything, so you have to go out and find it for yourself. So uh, that's more or less what I was going to say. Um, nobody fell asleep, which was great, first time. Uh, uh, so thanks for coming. Any, any, any more questions? Yeah, of course. Uh, but first. Yeah. No, I'm not saying you should work to, to, uh, to get rid of it. If you're happy with it, then that's fine. But uh, yeah, because that uh, was what I was aiming at. Uh, because 
that negativity is actually, uh, in my opinion, part of our identity. And us complaining in a cafe is a reason, is a very big part of Croatia. I, I, I would agree with you, and, and I would also, w w one of the other th things that I say that uh, the eight best things about, about here in Croatia is the humour, uh, because um, it took me a long time to appreciate Croatian humour, and Croatian humour is, is, is quite harsh, yeah? and so, um, uh, so I got uh, a couple of lawsuits uh, a couple of years ago from the National Tourist Board, and um, I'd never been sued in my life, and every foreigner that I said, I'm being sued. They went, oh my God, that's terrible. You know, how do you feel? Are you okay? Are you going to be okay? And every Croat I said, I'm being sued, they went, you're finally a Croat. Yeah. And so it's like the, 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 that, that sort of lack of sympathy of like, and, you know, of being there um, against the system is there. I mean, complaining's is fine. Um, and, um, but, but I also think that that's part of, it's part of the identity for sure, but it's also part of what brings us people down here and gets them to see that there is nothing positive. You know, the number of people on this uh, 10 Things Croatia Does Better Than Anywhere Else, I mean, you can find it on, on YouTube if you're interested, that said, wow, I've never really seen our country in this light. I never thought about our country in this way. And it takes a foreigner to come and have a look at the country and tell us how it is and stuff. And I'm just observing, I, you know, I, 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 I see a lot of negative things here. I see a lot of positive things here. But I also think that if we focus a lot more on the positive, it will be a lot better for our mindsets. And I think that's a healthy thing, personally. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I completely understand the complaining in the, in the cafes because, you know, it's the sun's out and everything else. And, you know, it's 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 a good thing. But um, let me tell you about uh, like uh, an example of something where people are complaining a lot and where I came up with a solution, which I took to the Minister of the of Tour Tourism and um, she's supporting it. If I can get some more support, which uh, is, is could be a problem. Um, Vukovar. Okay, is a topic that I never ever wrote about for many years because I felt as a foreigner I'm not qualified to, to go into the pain of what happens uh, for people in this country. Um, and I, you know, I was all, every time Vukovar was mentioned I'd just be very, very quiet because I couldn't have an opinion on this because I wasn't part of it, I wasn't Croatian and so on. Um, and then um, when my daughter was seven years old, so in uh, Purvi uh, on November the 19th, she came into our bedroom at six in the morning and she was shivering and she was shaking and, and looking really visibly um, upset. And I, and I said, uh, you know, what's wrong? And she just wouldn't answer. And so I got, got her into bed and I kept her warm and safe. And I was trying to think what could possibly be wrong. And she said, I think I had my first nightmare, dad. And I was like, how could you possibly have a nightmare living on Khvar with a very loving family and the you know, non and nonna downstairs and everything nice? And, and then I realized it was the day after November the 18th, so Vukovar day. So I just said that when she calmed down, I said, what did they tell you in school about Vukovar? And they said it was terrible, Dad. They, um, 
you know, they, uh, the Serbs came with their tanks and they blew things up and they got this old man and they put him on a rack and they stretched him and then they put cigarettes out in his eyes. Seven years old, right? And, and I was like, and then she goes, and then we had for homework, we had to draw for the heroes of Vukovar. We had to draw images of Vukovar, the fall of Vukovar um, for our homework. And so I said, can I see your homework? And she showed me this thing and, you know, I mean, you can find the article on, 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 on the website. And uh, I, I published her homework and uh, there was a Bravo Petitza uh, for, for the homework. And she said, some of my friends drew dead bodies, but uh, the teacher said we shouldn't do that, you know, because we're only seven, yeah? And, and this was in 19, eight, nine years ago, 2014. So this is like 20, 20 years after the war, yeah? And I was so outraged as a parent that I wrote a story on Telecreation News called, Is It Really Necessary to Poison the Minds of the Next Generation? And I was, it was the first time I'd ever written about Vukovar, and I was, I was expecting to be absolutely slaughtered. And there wasn't one commentary against me for it, yeah? Because everybody knew what I wrote was pretty much Usridu, uh, as I say, yeah? And, um, and so then I was, got curious and I decided I'm going to go to the Vukovar parade on November the 18th. And um, so I went with the Dubrovatsky Tromlinieri. Um, incredibly, uh, has, has anyone been? Yeah, it's one, yeah. I, I encourage you all to go. It's just, it's, it, it's, uh, it's really, really kind of um, emotional, but very, very educational. And I came back really angry. Um, at the politicians and about the fact that, you know, this is a one day, a one day thing. And everybody talks about, you know, the heroes and the city and stuff. And so then, and then I went again in 2021 and I spent most of the time with people from Vukovar in the shops and everything else. And, and this one guy said to me, he says, you know, today I've given three uh, national TV interviews uh, for my OPG. We're very successful OPG here in Vukovar. And it's great to have the exposure but I would love one of those to be on December the 6th, and one of those will be on March the, 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 the 5th, and another one to be on June the 3rd, because we are a one-day destination only, and people are looking for a good story, and that's it. And then, you know, so this kind of stuck with me that, you know, everybody's talking about the poor East, and we should do more for Vukovar and all this. Um, and then uh, I took this American digital nomad, Steve Tenserensky, I mentioned, um, and I said to him, how much do you know about Eastern Croatia? And he said, Vukovar, uh, there was a war, that's it. And I said, okay, uh, give me six days of your life in November. Bring your drone, all your cameras, and I will arrange a six day trip around Eastern Croatia, which will totally blow your fucking mind. Will be the best experience you've had in your time in Croatia in November. And he's like, really? And I said, really? He said, okay, let's do it. So I then contacted the regional tourist boards and said, this is my plan. I want to really sort of get to know Eastern Croatia. I want to have the absolute best um, itinerary possible. And they said, fine. So we left at six in the morning from, uh, from, um, uh, from Zagreb. We went to Ilochki Podrum, uh, you know, the, the world famous wine place. Uh, we went, to, we said at Principovac, which is the, uh, the sort of um, estate they have there overlooking the vineyards of the golf course, a beautiful place. Next day we went to Vucilo. Uh, we went to Ovčara. Up the, up the Vukovar water tower. Um, then we went to um, Vinkovci, uh, Otočki Virovi. There's a zero carbon hotel in the forest there. Um, and then the next day was the Vukovar parade, the whole thing, um, which was just mind blowing. Uh, and then in the evening, we went to this really bizarre English pub in a field in the middle of nowhere outside the village of Andriashevci near Vinkovci. And this is an, this is a, an, an English war veteran, Steve Gaunt, his name is. And uh, he came to fight for Croatia in 91, got wounded, lost his foot, ended up being a war uh, veteran, married a girl from Vinkovci, six children, um, wanted to have his own pub, so bought a piece of land literally in the middle of nowhere and built the White Boar pub with photographs of the Queen um, at the age of 17, cricket balls, all this sort of stuff. It's, it's an amazing, amazing place. And on November the 18th, after the parade through Vukovar, he takes uh, all the foreign volunteers, the Swedes and the French and the Germans who fought for Croatia in 91, now with their sort of eye patches minus their arms and everything else. They all march in their black shirts, their Hoss uh, shirts and everything else, as Adolf Spremnies and all that. And they all come to this pub for a barbecue. And it's just, it's 
was surreal, you know, so I've been there like two days. And Steve was just like, his eyes were popping out, you know, all this sort of stuff. And then the next day we went to, um, we went to Dal, uh, which is a village I'd never heard of, which has the wines of Jasta Antunovic and this world-class museum of the Serbian scientist called Milutin M M M Milutinovic or something, I, f I forget his name now. He's like known as one of the top 15 scientists in the world and he's got this incredible museum in his birthplace which is only visited by 3,000 people every year, okay? And then we went off to the wines of Erdut and then obviously Osijek. Next day we went all over Baranja, uh, incredible, then to Jacobo. And we were posting on Facebook the whole sort of time. People were going, wow, where is this place? I'm like, this is Eastern Croatia. Ne never knew about this, right? Mm -hmm. So I then got back to Zagreb and I said to all my friends in Zagreb, Eastern Croatia is phenomenal. You know, um, when was the last time you were there? Never been, never been, never been. And I was like, wow. So here you have a situation where you have all these proud people. Uh, every November the 18th, they change their Facebook status to Grad Heroje Nechimo Zaboravit and all that bullshit. And then the next day, they change the photo back to the life on the, on the cello on the beach in Dalmatia. And that's what they do. And they have no idea about any of this. You have this region of Croatia on its knees um, economically, but with a phenomenal tourism offer and hospitality. And you've got all these people in Zagreb who have no idea that that's there, right? And you have all this patriotism, yeah? So put all this into a pot, and I came up with an idea, uh, which I presented to Bunyats. Um, but before I did that, I asked, I had three questions, which I've asked 70 people in uh, Zagreb so far, and 69 out of the 70 could not answer all three questions. So only one person, uh, the former communications director of the prime minister, uh, got all, all three questions right. And to me, they're quite simple questions, but this highlights the lack of knowledge in Zagreb about Eastern Croatia. And if people in Zagreb don't know about Eastern Croatia, how will tourists know about it? So I'm not going to embarrass you by saying who knows the answers, but these are the three questions and you can, you can, you can mark yourself. What is the main town in Baranja? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm older. Yeah, you're older. So, so yeah. So be, you be quiet then. Yeah. Uh, so, but that's the one that people just don't know. You know. Uh, can you name three famous buildings in eastern Croatia, not including the Vukovar water tower? It's the team effort from the whole thing. Eastern Croatia, yeah, but, but no, not including the book of Yeah, 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 okay. And the final question is, can you name three Slavonian dishes that don't include kulen? Kulen. Yeah, so, um, but interesting, isn't it? I mean, th th those are not, those are three things that you'd expect maybe somebody to know about. So I then was, got my, my bit of my, my soup and, and I'm like, okay, Javanitz, yeah, of course. Uh, and I'm like, uh, how can we turn this into a positive thing rather than just complaining about everything, okay? So I came up with the concept called the Vukovar card, okay? And the Vukovar card is a once in a lifetime uh, commitment um, for you to uh, pay your respects, learn about, and actually benefit from uh, a trip to the East. And so the idea is that we put together a four or seven day itinerary where you come from Australia for three weeks every year to go to the cello and then, then to go to the beach. One week out of those three, once in your lifetime, you do the Vukovar card tour and you go and pay your respects to Vukovar, you learn about Vukovar, you meet the families of Vukovar, you spend money in the cafes, the restaurants, the tours, the hotels of Vukovar. Um, and also, you have this amazing trip that we had from um, Ilochki Podrum to, to Balanya. 
and you really learn about the amazing things that are there in eastern Croatia. So this isn't charity, this is actually a massive edu positive ed education experience for everybody. And um, once you do this, you get your Vukovar card, which is a bit like a Ponos Hrvatska kind of stuff. And uh, all these people that have their cafes and restaurants and hotels on, on the Obola, on the coast, who change their Facebook status every uh, November the 18th, they give a 10% discount to anybody who has the Vukovar card. Okay, so this is their contribution to the whole thing. Um, and then the minister, it's a win for the minister because we have this stupid project called the Crow Card, which never worked. So all the infrastructure of doing that is there. And we just slip in the Vukovar card concept into the Crow Card. And then this is the ministry doing something for the East, which is a, a win. And so what you have is um, finally people do something more than just changing their Facebook status. They actually connect with Vukovar. They put money into the, in, into, uh, into the businesses of Vukovar. And you also learn about the tourism and help develop the tourism. And for the first time in Croatian history, everybody wins. So, you know, so there's an idea of taking something that everyone complains about and say, okay, let's look at all the factors here and let's see how we can change it. So I went to see the minister and she said, it's brilliant, I love it. Okay. Still waiting. Yeah. So you have a question. Do we get to visit the English part of the world? Yeah, yeah, if, 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 yeah it's, uh, there's, a, there's a Facebook page called White Boar, B-O-A-R, uh, White Boar Croatia. Just, uh, and send them a message and just say that, just, just say I, I told them about it. Um, it's, it's an amazing place. He also grows, he, he's got the first uh, in, real English cider grown in Croatia. He's been grafting uh, cider trees and everything else. Uh, he's completely crazy. Um, but but, um, but, but uh, amazing guy, um, you know, and, and amazing place. Yeah. Okay, uh, more questions? I have another one. Okay. Uh, I know in these two countries, uh, These are Poland and Slovenia, for example. Okay. And they are kind of more successful than we are. Yeah. So what, what do you think, what are the other contributing factors to general you know, advancement of a nation? I mean, uh, you know, I mean, the... the, the uh, yeah. Poland uh, lost like more than 10% of their population that moved uh, to the Western countries, which is very similar to our situation. But they all came back. Uh, I mean, I, I lived in a town in, in, uh, in Oxfordshire, uh, well, Banbury. 10% of our population at one point was Polish. 10%. They were coming to pack the chickens and that sort of stuff. Um, and then they made their money. Uh, they were plumbers. They, were, they worked really hard. And then they went back and they bought property. And if you look at the types of cars that Poles drive coming to, on holiday to Croatia today than 15 years ago, it's uh, that they they've really really um, yeah, and, and it's. It, is, uh, I visited Poland in 20 years apart. Yeah. Uh, I was in Warsaw in 2005, and I, I uh, saw Trabant cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But today uh, there is not anymore. So I, I was in Krakow last year. Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, it's an amazing advancement that they achieved as a nation during 20 years. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think, well, well, you are, but you, but, you know, you, you look at, I mean, Slovenia and Croatia are similar, but Slovenia didn't have a war. So, you know, and I'm not an expert on Slovenian politics, but if they managed to steal as much as these guys did, that would be quite an achievement. Um, and, and they're also very mentally closer to Austria, I think, than, than we are, so. Um, Yeah, it's funny because it's funny because because every time I, I you know when I when I did this thing, ten things that Croatia does better than anywhere else in the world, um, and was like corruption, corruption, stealing, corruption, and uh, not. I mean, there's there's you know I've got friends in Romania going, what the hell are you talking about? You know, you look at corruption, you look at Romania. There's like there's no there's no uh, comparison to it. And also the thing that makes me laugh about Croats talking about language is. Uh, 
oh, but isn't Croatian so hard? Or the Padaji, you know, it's really, really hard. I mean, Croatia is a Slavic language. All Slavic languages have Padaji. You know? I, I, I learned Russian at university, and I, I lived in Russia for a year and a half. And so I learned all my Padaji uh, the hard way through, through Russian. And trust me, Cro Croatian is not more difficult than any other Slavic language. Yeah, okay. But here it's like it's the most difficult. Lovely, uh, since we have technologies to here, yeah. uh, the technology is changing how the businesses are being done. I think so. I mean, I, I know a, I mean, I'm a, I know a Canadian lawyer who is remote working. I mean, lawyers have doc need documents, you'd think, but she's uh, she's living in Bol and uh, she's loving it and she's doing her client stuff and. Well, this, this is one of the funny things because, you know, and especially in Australia, an Australian friend was telling me that, you know, uh, when you go to emigrate to, 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 to Croatia, you have this big party and everything else, that everyone expects you to come back. And in Croatia, when you leave, it's almost like it's, it's shameful if you were to return. It, it, feel, it feels like that. It's, it's, you know, and I feel that that is... Um, incredible pressure and I would, I, I don't know the statistics, but I know a lot of people in Ireland that have got crappy jobs, really expensive rents, everything's expensive and they're putting on this show and then yes, they have a bit more money and they come back on holiday and like, here's me really successful and then they, and they can't return yeah. because to do that. But having said that, I think there is a shift now because people are seeing, especially with the remote work revolution, that returning to Croatia and starting a business or returning to Croatia and, you know, and, and doing something, is, it's no, there's no longer that stigma of, I failed. I come back to Croatia because I choose to because I see opportunity here. And that, you know, I mean, look at Remats, look at Infobip, but look at so many more companies like that, smaller, but we're now attracting really high class Western and American talents to come and live in Croatia and work. So it's, not, it's no longer, you know, gosh, uh, I can't get a job because of nepotism. There's, there's a whole entrepreneurial class which has grown in the last 10, 15 years in Croatia, which has nothing to do with the state. And so you don't, and, and these people are hiring on merit. They're not hiring on, on connections. And, 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 that, and, and these people can't find the talent in Croatia, so they're having to import it from Western Europe. So, you know, I think if we can, again, get the mindset and, and, and see the opportunities here and help our younger people to train and to educate themselves for those positions, I think it's a, it's a really, really um, interesting... Um, Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, employing that knowledge as a competitive advantage, for example, in, uh, in developing large projects. Let me find an example in wind plants, for example. Yep. Uh, I know two, two people, I uh, quite often bring them here to, to yep. this room to speak to students yep. uh, who actually learned how to. Uh, go through the, the, this uh, labyrinth of yep. uh, very complex and complicated uh, uh, legislation and regulation and everything, yep. and who uh, build almost out of nothing a very small personal investment organized to build a, a big power plant, which they are now own in 25% share. Yep. Well, I'm, I, one of the people I'm working with, and I'm just starting the relationship, is a girl called Clara. Uh, she's 29 from Chakovitz, and uh, she left Croatia when she was 18. She uh, did a uh, master's at Northeastern University of Boston. She was the best student in the year. She did a master's in Bristol in law. And at the age of 29 and 10 years international experience, she moved back to Chakovitz to help with the family business, but also to open her own consultancy helping, using all those international contacts and helping 
uh, Croatian uh, international businesses that wanted to do business in Croatia. And so she can help with all the paperwork, but she also has access to all the Natachai and all the things that are going on. So we're now putting those people together, and then she's the one that, that makes those things happen. And there is uh, somebody who could have stayed in the States and everything else, but she wants to come back, do something for Croatia, employ people in Croatia, and start building and bringing investment into Croatia. And that, you know, it's not massive numbers now, but that's one example of one of those bubbles that I'm connected to, you know, and then, so I've already connected, oh, you must meet this person because this person can help you with this, you know? And this is the, this is the positive Croatia that's being built outside of Uklevistan. And it's, uh, it's an incredibly interesting and dynamic place. And um, I think it's got a, a huge future and I'm, I'm really excited to be part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, why? I don't know. I, I think um, uh, <laughs> when I moved from Dalmatia to Varaždin, I was um, it was it was quite a shock with the mentality and uh, and the work ethic and stuff. You know, it's people have to try harder in the north because they don't have the, the gift of tourism, for example. Um, but there's that meant there's more of that Austrian mentality, uh, I think, in the north than there is and. The, the, the best workers in Croatia, by far, are always from Slavonia, always. Uh, if you look in tourism on the coast, the best of them are always from Osijek or from Baranja or from somewhere around there. I think, um, uh, but I, I, I have a huge amount of respect for the people in the north of Croatia because they don't have as much and they really, really uh, utilize what they do. They're also very close to Slovenia, Austria and stuff like that, so, uh, and, and, and markets and stuff. But I think Medjimori is a fascinating, um, how many of you have been to Medjimori? Okay, all right, okay, well, still, you know, you guys got to travel more, man. Uh, I very vivid, you would uh, think uh, at first that it's uh, actually a rural. Uh, yeah, it's very, it's, it's they've country. got a lot of it, a lot of industry there. A lot of uh, industrial yeah. technology, yeah. which you never hear about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, for di no, so for for uh, so th there's a there's a website called nomadlist.com, and this is uh, like probably the, the best the bible uh, nomadlist.com, and uh, this is something where uh, nomads register, and so their data is tracked in real time, so you can actually find you can extrapolate from that how many nomads nomads are in different, and you can see the trends with different cities and stuff like that, and then they do this big survey every year. And uh, so for the last two years, Zagreb has been named as um, in the top five most, uh, most liked nomad cities in Europe, um, which is amazing since we only started Digital Nomad Week in 2021. So we start, yeah. Um, and then they also have a lot of different things about um, what do nomads eat, uh, you know, what they like to do, uh, what's their sort of income brackets, uh, so you can, you can build profiles. And one of them was about safety and what's the ratio male to female nomad for certain cities. So male nomads go to split a lot more because the women are really beautiful. Shallow, but, but true. Um, but uh, but safe, safety for Croatia was like a 20% swing for that, yeah. And if, if you speak to nomads here, I mean, we've, we've interviewed a lot of them, and it's like the women are like, this is just a city that I can walk home at midnight and not feel anything. Do you think that this The, the recent. The recent immigration growth. I mean, I you know it's 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 an interesting topic because um, I just did a video on this and I got. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, people say that you know. So I don't know if whoever hasn't seen the video uh, or two videos. So in 2018, there was a um, just before the World Cup final the French Anti-Racism League sent out a tweet saying that Croatia was very racist because it didn't have any black players in its team. Okay. That's what they said about Argentina as well. Okay, and then, uh, you know, and then, you know, so the, the obvious reply is that Nigeria didn't have any white players in their team, so they're also quite racist, yeah? So, 
But, you know, so it was kind of a story. But then it got me thinking. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I've traveled the world. And in 2004, I was sitting um, in Yelsa on the piazza and I saw a black person walking across and I stared. Not, not out of anything, but just like, wow, that's unusual. Uh, and I've lived in Rwanda, Somalia, um, Japan, you know, uh, I've traveled all over these places. And for me to actually have that sort of thing was, and so I, I then thought, wow, what, what must it be like for Croatians who didn't have that multicultural upbringing that I had, um, and so on. And then I suddenly looked around and I was like, wow, everybody's white. And I hadn't really noticed it, right? So then I got quite curious and I was like, I wonder how many foreigners live with temporary and permanent residents in Croatia in 2018. Okay. So I, um, I uh, contacted MUP and I said, can you give me the statistics? And so they sent them down and I was shocked. There were 29,156 foreigners who didn't have Croatian passports. So uh, this includes Serbs and Bosnians who were not Croatian citizens as well. And, um, and that made us 99.3% Croat. Yeah, and there aren't that many black Croats, there are some. Um, one, one of my writers actually, she's, uh, she's half, half Croatian, half South African. And um, of those 29,000, I would say most of those were white as well. So I did an article talking about this anti-racism thing, saying that Croatia was the whitest country in the world, okay? And it was just, I don't want to talk about what happened next. It was just, a, it was a huge, huge article and, and lots of like, back and forth and back and forth. And then, you know, I've noticed a lot of, uh, as every, you know, the Nepalese, the Filipinos, the Indians and stuff working here. So I contacted MUP again and I said, uh, uh, you know, two months ago, and I said, can you give me the statistics today? How much has it changed in five years? Because I think it's changed quite a lot. And they came back and I was, it was, it was quite, quite interesting. So in 2018, th there were five countries with more than 1,000 nationals with temporary or permanent residency in Croatia. And they were Bosnia, Serbia, Slovenia, Germany, and Italy. Yeah? In 2023, there were 19. And the number two country was Nepal, with 8,910 people with temporary residence for a year or permanent residency. And there's also, also these ones on short-term uh, working contracts. In the top 10, there was the Philippines and there was India. And the total number, and, and interesting, there were, there were more people from Uzbekistan living in Croatia with, with, with residency than Brits today, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, and uh, the total number was 127,000. So in four, four and a half, five years, we've gone from 29,000 to 127,000 plus 22,000 Ukrainians who don't have, um, um, they have temporarily kind of stuff as well. And so I did the calculations and I said, so now we are 95.2% Croat. I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I'm, we're no longer the whitest country in the world because we've got, you know, 8,000, we've got 9,000 uh, Nepalese and this and this and this. And so I did, a, I, I did the first video about, you know, we are the whitest, part one and then we're no longer the whitest, just to say this is how things have changed. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm just saying it's a thing that perhaps is an interesting discussion point. And it, it became an interesting discussion point, and people were shocked, and people like, we have to stop this, you know? Do I think there's gonna be um, more crime? I think uh, inevitably when you have uh, immigrants on a, uh, who are a little bit more desperate, that's gonna d definitely um, have an effect. I think, I think people like the Nepalese are extremely hard workers. Uh, I think they're very honest. Uh, so, and I think uh, they'll be a credit to the uh, Croatian economy, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think inevitably, yes, there will be a, uh, a, 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 an increase in, in, in crime, of course. Um, will it be huge? I don't think so, but we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. Uh, well, I, I, uh, on the island of Khoa, there are three. There are three types of people. There's uh, there's the foreigner who moves there. There's the islander who's been away and travelled, and then come back. And then there's the islander who's never left the island. Which of those three knows the most about life? 
no, the islander who's never left the island. So, and it's the same in Croatia. You have a lot of people who've never left Croatia, and they think Croatia's the best in the world for this, 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 Croatia's this, Croatia's the worst in the world, Croatia's, everything's, everything's like this, and they have no real experience of Croatia um, apart from inside, so they've got no international perspective on Croatia. And I think um, one of the things I find from people who left and have come back is they really, really appreciate the things like the safety, the lifestyle, the community, the food, you know, the nature, the things we were talking about earlier. And unless you've been away, it's very, very hard to have a complete picture of your own environment. So, um, you know, I, um, I, I always had certain things I thought about the UK, and, uh, and then, I, then I, I traveled, and I, I've spent most of the last 20 years apologizing for my colonial um, grandparents and stuff uh, in, in Africa and stuff, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm actually quite embarrassed to say I'm from the UK. But, you know, you, gr you, you grow up in a society where you're, you're given all this kind of information. Um, and I, th I think traveling is uh, one of the best investments you can make in yourself. Uh, and if you get the chance to do a year or two years living in another country, studying, working in another country, take it and uh, try and learn some of the language and uh, you know that, that will help you uh, culturally as well but it will really give you a different perspective on your country but try and be aware of the good and the bad of your country before you go away um, a lot of people just think Croatia is terrible I need to leave uh, Croatia has lots of faults lots of faults it also has lots of magic and it's good to be aware of both of those things and then when you travel to compare the bad things and the good things. So here, a lot of people complain about, ah, oh, but property is so expensive now. Um, you know, you can, we won't be able to buy a house on the coast, right? 1996, I bought my first house uh, at the age of 27, and it was 47,000 pounds, and I got a mortgage of 20,000 20, pounds, and my dad lent me some money, and I, I had about 1,000 pounds. And uh, I sold that house three years later for 90,000 pounds to somebody who was buying it for the first time. And then two years later, they sold it for 180,000 pounds to somebody who was buying it for the first time. And after that, nobody who's buying for the first time can afford to buy that house because it's too expensive. So people in the UK were priced out of first time buying 25 years ago. But here in Croatia, it's very unfair because we can't buy houses. You know, um, Croatia has some of the highest home ownership in Europe. You know, people own their own homes here and they've got down in the coast, they have multiple homes and stuff like that. So, um, you know, things aren't as bad here as, uh, as, as they are portrayed at times and stuff. But try and be aware of what's good and what's bad. Um, look, compare, and maybe you'll find that another country's um, better for you. Good, good luck for that. And maybe you'll learn to appreciate, actually, there are some things in Croatia that really, really are amazing and are worth returning for. Um, I had a comment today, a woman from Ireland, she said, I'm watching your videos on TikTok and YouTube, and I'm really, really thinking, I'm really missing home, and I'm really thinking of coming home. You know, because they don't, because people sit in their complaining cafes, they don't actually spend the time focusing on the positives. And if you do that, I think you'll see a slightly different perspective of Croatia, especially if you travel abroad. You'll find out things that you miss. Um, but I do encourage people to travel, for sure, for sure. Okay, so it's traveling means Yep. Oh, it's not. It's not. It's still, it's still a concept because I, I went to see the. I went to see the minister. She said, "I love it. We'll support it." And then uh, the next time I met her, she goes, "I can't support it. Sorry, I can't. I, I can give you a letter, but I can't do more than that." Um, and so uh, uh, the, the, there's a video on my YouTube channel which explains it all. Um, and uh, because I was being sued by the National Tourist Board, it was not very likely they were going to give me some money for it. So uh, I'm basically I've said to people, if somebody wants to take this idea forward, I'll give them free media support and they can have the concept and stuff. But not something I can do myself. But that's just an example of how you can look at a, look at a situation and rather than be negative about it, try and come up with a solution. Okay. I have a question for you in the audience. Uh, if you contemplate moving out to another country, which I'm not saying that you should, but if you do, uh, what do you think, what are the, the most important things? Uh, 
say that you will get some education here in this faculty, in this building, and you will uh, go with some set of skills and knowledge and whatever. But uh, what do you think uh, is important if you want to move abroad and be successful in business and life? Do you know what I'm targeting? Do you mean like what can we learn from living abroad or...? No, no, if you want to go abroad, uh, what do you think is uh, the most important or are the most important things to uh, have with you when you make this decision? I think is to uh, realize the give and take situation of any country, not just Croatia, for instance, uh, England, uh, has uh, greater uh, uh, greater uh, opportunities for business and for improvement, but uh, has faults elsewhere, and we need to be informed on what the uh, benefits and what the uh, 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 what the pros and cons are of moving where. Okay. And what do you think about common things like uh, learning the language of the country where you're going to? You have to learn the country where you live. And um, you know, uh, engaging into the culture when you get there, adopting to their situation, and so on and so on. And instead of uh, you know making Croatian communities uh, in yeah. Germany, for example, which is in my mind a, a, a mistake. So you have to live. If you want to live elsewhere, you have to live there. You know. Yeah. It, it, it was very, very interesting um, when I went to Albania in 2002, and I, so I'd been all over former Yugoslavia, and I was in Sarajevo after the war. There were 7,000 NATO troops, so a huge international market, and there was only one Indian restaurant. And you come to Zagreb in. 20 years ago, there was a terrible Indian and a terrible Chinese, and that was it. And you go to the Belgrade, Belgrade it's the same. And then you go to Albania, and there were like 20 different uh, types of restaurants, Swedish, German, Japanese, everything, run by Albanians. And, and basically, and basically the, uh, the Albanian communities seemed to go as diaspora. They went and they would integrate with their, um, their hosts. And the Croatians and the, Yugos of the, of the and the Serbs would go into their communities and sort of stay there. And it was it was to me it was very very striking the difference between um, Albania and, and former Yugoslavia in that sense. Um, funny uh, thing about Albania, uh, they have a stereotype uh, because in the former Yugoslavia they were known actually uh, for the opposite. They were known for having their little clique of Albanians and uh, the other Yugoslavs would uh, gang, up, gang up on them get together and actually uh, spend time together right. on uh, Ravna Aksia. Okay, okay, right. Okay. The biggest thing to take on your travels uh, is for me, is, uh, it's, it's free, is curiosity. Okay. okay. Any more? Thank you for being with us and having a nice discussion and very interesting. And, uh